we'll uh, start off with um, presentations by four speakers. And uh, the webinar today is uh, co-organized uh, by Strathmore Law School at the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights and the program uh, for the foundations of law and uh, constitutional government. And uh, we have uh, four different speakers uh, speaking on four different uh, contexts. We'll start off um, hearing uh, from Dr. Ambani uh, from Strathmore on uh, Kenya's constitutional setting and um, the challenges of separation of powers. And then uh, we'll hear from Professor Tarun Kaitan uh, on, on India's uh, case. Uh, from there, we'll uh, move to Professor Kato Reagan, and she will be speaking on South Africa. And then finally, we'll have uh, Professor Paul uh, Craig speaking on, on the UK. So before we uh, move into uh, their presentations. Uh, it's great for us at Strathmore to be hosting a, a series of webinars celebrating 10 years of um, Kenya's constitution. And um, some of you may know that uh, the 10 years uh, will be celebrated on 27th of August, so more or less in, in a month's time. And um, when Kenya's uh, new, we still call it the new constitution, I'm not sure that is correct. Perhaps Dr. Ambadi can speak to this um, in his presentation. Um, but when the 2010 constitution was promulgated, um, there was you know, a lot of hope and um, a lot of expectation in terms of the transformative, um, the transformative uh, elements of the constitution. And, um, Part of this webinar series is really to, to look at the 10 years and take stock um, and also reflect um, on some of the challenges uh, which have been there along the way. So I'd like to uh, ask uh, the Dean of Strathmore Law School, who uh, is joining us today, uh, just to give us a few remarks before we start. I'm not sure if he has joined, so let me have a look. I think he's yet to to join us. Uh, so I think we can perhaps we can go ahead uh, so that we don't lose um, any more time. Uh, and we'll begin with uh, Ambani. Uh, so Ambani is a senior lecturer at uh, Strathmore Law School and the editor in chief of uh, Strathmore Law Journal. So he will speak for 15 minutes. Uh, and then after that, we'll hear from, from Tarun. Uh, welcome, or karibu, to, to Ambani. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Mukami, for giving me the road. Um, I must begin by um, thanking the Oxford delegation uh, for joining us in two ways. One, joining us as Strathmore, uh, which is your younger sibling. Uh, Strathmore Law School is not even 10. Um, and yet Oxford is the giant, the, um, the premier academic institution in every way you can imagine. And to hold your hands um, is quite encouraging. Um, it gives us confidence to move on, knowing that a big brother and sister is looking and, and you know, checking the way for us. I think that's really, really nice for us. Second, um, that the academics from Oxford also come from um, democracies that are more mature than us, they are older in that sense, um, the UK, India and South Africa, and Kenyan academics have always um, looked up to those jurisdictions, uh, for examples. Uh, Kenyan judiciary has borrowed heavily from South Africa, India and the UK all these years, and it's good to have a comparative analysis of our constitutions uh, together with those academics from those countries that we really emulate. So it's really exciting for me, and I must say thank you to all of you uh, the Oxford delegation. And thank you, Kate, for bringing Bonavero here together with us, and all of you for participating in this. So having said that, allow me to move on to my presentation. And I was thinking about the topic for it. Um, to be honest, I easily would have 
um, gone by the title that Professor Koto Gendo gave quite earlier, Constitutions Without Constitutionalism. That would easily have been a fitting title for my presentation. Uh, but then I thought that maybe it's good to have another word for it, another title for it. And I decided I should just call it Ideal Document in a Real Context, The Paradox of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Um, I hope you can see my PowerPoint right there. Um, um, it shows you clearly that I'm going to make just three points. Um, the first point I want to make is that the 2010 Constitution um, has incorporated the idea of separation of powers as best as one can possibly do it, I think. Um, that we have gone by the book written by Montesquieu, if you like, or James Madison, if you like, uh, for those who love the Federalist Papers, and that we have gone by the book, really, if you look at the document. But the reality is quite different uh, when we talk about separation of powers, uh, in the sense that you now have a powerful and overbearing presidency. Uh, the president can step on literally everyone in practice. Um, and that can happen even though the document is that ideal, as I've already mentioned. And so why is that the case? Um, I hazard three reasons. Uh, number one, the skewed market. Um, number two, the disappearance of values and even the capacity for shame. And number three, um, that those who then have morals might have disappeared from the scene. And so that leaves the country in the hands of a very, very overbearing presidency as we go forward. So allow me to just elaborate on each of those points, uh, then I can, I can have my cup of tea. Um, so we start by the ideal structure I've just mentioned. Um, looking at that presentation, Kenya has emulated those um, famous three, the famous organs, the famous three. Um, we have a legislative, um, we have an executive, uh, and we have a judicature, just as Montesquieu had said, and all writers really. Um, uh, Paul Craig, uh, you will want to know that we have read a lot of your work. And, and you talk about the English system, you talk about separation of powers. We really have that here. In addition to that, we actually have other institutions supporting democracy. Um, for those who are familiar with Kenya's constitution, um, they are, uh, there's an entire chapter called chapter, uh, chapter 15. There's a number of institutions there uh, meant to support the sovereignty of the people, democratic governance, and the idea of constitutionalism. There's a whole list in chapter 15, but I'm usually concerned with just a few, I think three or so in chapter 15. I think the others um, um, might not really fit in the discussion I want to have here. But I'm concerned mostly about the National Human Rights Institution, uh, which is the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights and Equality, uh, which in practice has been broken into three. Uh, we have the Office of the Auditor General and the Office of the Controller of Budget. I believe those institutions are autonomous enough um, they are independent enough, um, they have the necessary capacity to challenge the other organs, and I've usually thought that they could actually be the fourth organ of state. So in terms of exterior separation, I think Kenya's, Kenya's constitution has succeeded in having not just the three that Montesquieu talked about, but in addition to that, other institutions that are capable of supporting democracy in addition to those. We also have obeyed um, the Madison idea of uh, interior separation in the Federalist, I think it's 51 where he talks about this. Uh, we have used power to counteract power. Um, we are asking ambition to counteract ambition in this sense that even within the organs, we have been able to separate them. Um, you'll remember that in the Federalist, um, they talk about the judicature as being the less harmful organ, but the other two, we must think about them with suspicion. And in that regard, we have been able to split the legislature, which is usually a problematic organ if it comes to excesses. And we have split it at two levels, one at county level and the other one at the national level, what we call parliament. Um, and even parliament, we have broken it further into Senate and the National Assembly. And I hope that in that way, we have been able to use power to counteract power or ambition to counteract uh, ambition. At the executive level, again, we have broken it at two levels, at the national level, and at the county level. And there's even still a proposal in the constitution that even at the county level, we should break it further and further. Um, and we had expected, for instance, that by now, we would be having municipal uh, councils, we'd be having urban councils, we would be having some authorities at the village level, at the county, at the ward level, and, and stuff like that. Um, a lot of that is still in progress. 
But still, you can see the intention of the constitution to separate exteriorly and interiorly. And, and, and that's really actually at the constitutional level. Um, in terms of just some of the things I need to point out um, without separation of powers is that if you look at the three things we normally talk about, like personnel, our constitution succeeds in actually separating personnel. Um, for the first time since independence, we don't have a cabinet drawn from parliament. Um, um, I could say, and, and I think I put my students to this challenge before, that apart from two offices, which is the office of the attorney general and that of the chair of public service commission sitting in the judicial service commission, there's actually no other office that sits in more than one organ, practically speaking. Um, and so we've really been able to keep off the organs. We put very high walls that even the president doesn't sit in parliament anymore. Um, ministers are not drawn from parliament anymore. And, and I think that's really something we have done uh, beyond what we could even imagine could happen. If you talk to Kenyans before 2010, this is a high feat. It's a very serious um, uh, achievement that we have made in that regard. If you're looking at functions, um, I think we've been able to keep the functions within the organs that they're supposed to, uh, where they're supposed to lie. So for, for example, the legislative has the authority to make laws. It's the principal organ for lawmaking. Um, the executive is the principal organ for executing uh, you know, law and policy. And the judicature adjudicates over disputes. And I think that fundamental difference is there. Um, you could say there are overlaps here and there, but the overlaps are the normal ones. Um, where, for example, um, the judiciary might be having some lawmaking functions, probably making some rules, or judicial precedent, or maybe some ministers might be making some rules, and, and it's just as limited as that. Um, it's not as fundamental as ministers, um, say, adjudicating over disputes. I think we've been able to keep the functions within uh, the organs where they're supposed to lie. Um, in terms of checks and balances, our constitution is very good at that. Um, in the sense that it ensures that nearly every power is checked. Um, no power goes un, uh, unquestioned. So that the executive, which was very powerful at the document level in the previous constitutional order, has been really put to strict check. Um, you will see that we can impeach the president. Um, um, the president cannot just make law. It has to go through parliament. Whatever policies he has uh, have to go through parliament. Um, and parliament makes law, the president has no say. Um, uh, the only say he has, he has to give reasons and parliament can still disapprove. The president with two thirds majority, the president can dictate whether an act of parliament will come to, to, to force or not. The acts come naturally uh, on the expiry of some days. We, um, the Supreme Court can control the presidency power to you know, declare an emergency and so forth and so on. And so you can say clearly that our constitution puts sufficient checks on uh, on power. In addition, um, those separation, um, that separation of powers model is actually fortified by, by what I've kept calling the constitutional intelligence of our constitution. Um, constitutional intelligence in the sense that it takes away discretion in every way you can think about. Um, once the constitution came into force, it triggers itself and, and several things can run on their own, taking away discretion from uh, human beings. And that way, I think it's an addition um, to the system of checks and balances. So for example, I already mentioned Article 116 of the Constitution where, for example, once the law has been passed by parliament where the president signs a law, it will come into force, I think on the 14th day. Um, if you're looking at say, the validity of presidential elections, Article 144 of the Constitution, there's a whole procedure there that takes away a lot of discretion in the sense that when this happens, this happens, when that happens, that happens. And the constitution even gives the dates when, for example, the Supreme Court has to act, a petition has to be filed at this point, the Supreme Court has to act at this point, if there's a referendum or a new election within these days. And, and, and that's what I call constitutional intelligence in our case. And that fortifies the system of checks and balances, I believe. And so at a constitutional level, in other words, I'm arguing that our constitution has done very well, um, has done very well in containing power as much as a constitution possibly could. In reality, what is happening? A lot is happening. Um, for those that have been following developments in Kenya, you'll be familiar with the 2013 elections, 2017 elections. Um, the 2013 elections are what we have called the ICC elections. 
um, where our president and, and his deputy, for example, were running for elections as indictees of the ICC. Very contested election. Um, the election broke many rules in the book. Um, the election was a threat to institutions um, and it really led to a lot of tension um, that I think was finished um, um, in 2020 um, during the corona days. Um, we've managed to finish the breakdown of institutions just by July 2020. I'll be explaining that shortly. And it, you also will remember, for those who have been following uh, Kenyan politics, the handshake between the President Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, the Right Honorable Raila Odinga. And the handshake has meant, for example, um, that parliament is no more. Uh, one of Kenya's um, uh, foremost uh, legislators, uh, legislators, Honorable Kipchumba Mokomen, actually said that parliament was dead. And he was right, in my view, um, in the sense that as soon as the president had the handshake with the prime minister, they got nearly as many members of parliament on their side as they could. And for now, you don't hear of opposition within parliament. Um, all the bills that the president takes to parliament can pass, usually pass. And in fact, many of us now believe that the president has capacity and power to pass through parliament a constitutional, a constitutional amendment without, with ease, with a lot of ease, without a lot of tension. Um, so there's been a merger between the executive and the legislative in that regard. Um, in, in terms of other institutions, like for example, the National Human Rights Institution that I talked about, those ones have been dealt with so easily um, through maybe their, through for example, the appointment process of the commissioners to the various independent offices, um, suffocation of their budgets, they don't get the money. Um, in fact, I hear most of them are idle. And as we speak, there's even an attempt to match the different national human rights institutions, that is the Gender Commission, the Ombudsman, and the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, the idea is to match them, um, having lost resources um, significantly. The judiciary, if one could mention, um, is going through a lot of turmoil. Uh, the judicial budget has been cut significantly. Uh, the president has defied court orders time and again. And as we speak, in fact, the president has declined to appoint the judges that were recommended by the Judicial Service Commission. Um, the judiciary has been fighting. And at some point, it seems that the Chief Justice is left alone in this context. Um, he almost uh, is speaking alone. And we have had terrible drama, um, terrible drama you don't want to mention here, um, including um, um, a child, child maintenance case against the Chief Justice. Uh, which many people believe was mooted by the executive. So sad, uh, the executive had to stoop that law. Um, if you're looking at the interior separation, Nairobi County government has been taken over by the presidency. In fact, militarized. Uh, the entire leadership is now a military leadership. And, and one could go on and on. Um, there's now decay of institutions. There's now collapse of institutions, thanks to the activities of the presidency. So one might want to ask, um, how did this happen with such an ideal constitutional document? How was it even possible that a president could do this? Uh, many of us um, thought that the last president to wield that enormous power was going to be President uh, Kibaki um, before, the repealed before the constitution came into force. But Uhuru Kenyatta has succeeded to do what the other presidents did or even more with a more strict constitution. And I've been agonizing over this issue for some time. And I think I have the answer to this. Um, I could be wrong. Um, I think the first answer to this problem, or the first reason for this problem, is the skewed market conditions. Um, I have come to believe that democracy thrives in a certain context, um, um, a context that almost goes with a system of capitalism, uh, market, uh, market system um, where uh, there's free market, um, where there's liberty and freedoms. Um, but what happens then if one person or um, you know, a few people who are working together have far more resources than everyone else? You see? Um, they could control uh, the democracy. Um, and I suspect that is what has happened in Kenya, that the president and his family and a few other families, uh, because I believe in Kenya to get wealth, you need to be close to the executive. And so those that have been close to the executive have 
wielded a lot of power and influence. And in that connection, they have been able to have enough resources to run presidential campaign, sponsor parliamentary elections, sponsor different contests here and there, and eventually taking full control of institutions that matter. I suspect that's how they took over uh, parliament. And so as we speak right now, all parliamentarians in a way or the other, or their allegiance to the president or to Honda Borail Odinga, uh, also uh, both of them son of first president and first de deputy president respectively. And so the country is actually a transom. In other words, I'm saying the president can afford all of us. And it, it helps the situation that we also have a price and that price is affordable to them um, as, as Kenyans. Uh, the value system has gone low, I think. And together with that, people are no longer ashamed, for example, of being mentioned in a, in a corruption case, uh, being mentioned of having looted uh, or brought down a corporation. And that makes it quite easy for them to take over um, the system that we have. I also think that as that happens, those that are moral enough or who should stand for morality have shied away from doing that, either out of cowardice or probably they are picking their battles. And this is not one of the battles, or this is not the right time to fight. And for the first time in, the, in my life, since I began following politics, um, it has been possible that the president is not challenged at all in parliament. Um, all presidents, from President Moi, have always had three, four, five MPs that spoke against them, uh, whether it was the bearded sisters in the early 80s, um, to the young stars in the, in the early 90s. Um, you can imagine right now, there's almost no challenge. So I want to finish by saying that these three factors have destroyed what the constitution imagined to be an ideal situation for Kenya. And I think that is the situation in Kenya. An ideal constitution, a terrible contest, uh, context, you know. So the document is fine, but the reality is really sad. I want to stop my presentation there for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ambani. Uh, I think you've given us a very quick rundown of uh, 10 years. And uh, I can see we already have some uh, great questions um, on what you've spoken. Uh, so uh, before I ask uh, Tarun to speak, I'd like to uh, just invite uh, the Dean of uh, Strathmore, Dr. Peter Quenjera, um, uh, just to, to give his uh, remarks um, and his uh, thanks for today's webinar. Welcome, uh, Dr. Quenjera. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me just, uh, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I'm sorry I joined you a bit late. I had other engagements at the law school in the morning. And then I was a bit confused with the link, but Mokami sorted it out. Yes. Um, yeah, I am recently appointed Dean of the law school, uh, basically beginning 1st of July uh, 2020. Yeah, I complained that this was not the time to be appointed Dean. Uh, during a crisis of coronavirus, uh, the first time ever we have to do things online. Even our new students, we had to welcome them online. It's the first time we did an orientation for freshmen and women uh, through an online platform. Uh, but uh, I am sure that we are all in the spirit that uh, this can be done. Uh, and we will ride the crisis and come out victorious and stronger. Yeah, so I, I have listened to Dr. Ambani's presentation, uh, very candid uh, views on what is happening in our country. I sympathize a lot with what he has said about the judiciary, uh, because my thesis precisely is about the integrity of the judiciary. And um, in my thesis, when I did it, uh, that was 2016. Of course, I picked up on those issues that are affecting our judiciary and it has been weakened for real. And I don't know where we stand. Someone asked me today, oh, the president has made some orders about the pandemic yesterday. Uh, should we take him to court and complain? I said, yeah, you could, but it could be an academic exercise because in the past he has been taken to court and he has not obeyed those court orders. So I just told them, you just live with them for now, and we look for other avenues of fighting. Uh, 
Anyway, I wasn't to comment on the on the separation of powers. Uh, my task was to just welcome you. I should have done that welcoming at at uh, twelve o'clock. So I'm sorry, I'm doing it after Mbani has spoken. Um, and I do appreciate the work that is being done by the Strathmore University Press, uh, headed by Mbani, who is our managing editor and uh, they are working on a lot of publications that will take legal education to another level. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to the Bonavero Institute. On behalf of the law school, I want to thank uh, Kate, Kate Regan for being with us. And um, uh, it is not the first time that we are collaborating on something. I know I wasn't there maybe last year or last year, but one, I know that Mbani and company did even come to the UK for some events. Yeah, because this way we can continue enriching our academic field and to make sure that students both in Kenya and in the UK have a lot of resources to draw from, from the work that we are doing. And um, I am also happy that we are going to be celebrating 10 years of our constitution. Um, with this series we are doing, um, some very good publication will come of it and again it will enrich the way we teach constitutional law here in Kenya and for other countries that are involved we will be able to do a comparative study because the chapters and the books that will come out of um, this initiative will definitely help uh, researchers in this event. Um, yeah, I, in the past we have also worked a lot with uh, Dr. Dominic Babich he has uh, taught in our um, master's program. He has taught in our undergraduate program at the Strathmore Law School. And again with him, uh, there is a lot of work on law and governance that has been done together. And yeah, I wouldn't want to say more than that, but uh, to thank the organizers uh, and not just for this particular session, but for the whole series of webinars that have been organized uh, to take stock of the 10 years of our 2010 constitution. And we can already see that uh, we are faced with a lot of challenges, uh, but as academics, uh, well, it's our work to look into the challenges, solutions, and hopefully some person will take up uh, what we propose and make it a reality. I, I don't know whether Professor Kibwana is, uh, Mukami is Professor Kibwana with us? Uh, I'm not sure either. Uh, Professor Kibwana. Good morning, good afternoon. I, yeah, I can't see him here. Yeah. Um, he's but coming, he should. Yeah. Uh, all right, it's just for the purposes of recognizing him as the governor of Makueni and uh, as a person who has really been very involved in our constitutional governance and reforms in our country. Yeah, and he was also my lecturer for jurisprudence. So when I saw the flyer, I saw his name. So I thought, yeah, sorry, yeah, then we will recognize him when he comes. So I would say a uh, good job and uh, keep it up. And uh, from law school, we are very happy to be involved in this initiative. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Dean. I know that you, you're uh, required in many places uh, at one time. So thanks for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, and hopefully we can continue the conversation with you um, also afterwards. Uh, so after uh, Dr. Ambani's um, presentation, uh, our next uh, presenter uh, is uh, Tarun Kaitan, and uh, Tarun is uh, the Professor of Public Law and uh, Legal Theory at the Hackney Fellow in Law at Wadham College. He's uh, currently uh, a future fellow at the University of, of Melbourne, um, where he's been since uh, uh, 2017. Uh, so um, it will be interesting to hear from him about um, the contemporary challenges for separation of powers in in India. So he'll speak for 15 minutes uh, and then um, we'll hear from uh, Kate. Welcome Tarun. Thanks very much Mukami and uh, it was I, I, I listened to Dr. Ambani with um, uh, 
with a sense of deep uh, recognition and unease because uh, the story I'm about to tell you is not vastly different from the story that we have just heard, um, although the context is different. Um, you know, we are uh, sort of watching the, the rise of autocrats around the world in, in established and new democracies. 2020 is the fifth, uh, 10th year of uh, the Kenyan constitution. It is the 70th year of the Indian constitution. Um, and, and yet uh, some of the challenges that we are facing are very similar. So I'm going to, um, present a slideshow with you. I'm not sure if you can see it on your screens uh, already. If you, okay, great. So um, here is the challenge, right? Uh, a lot of us in India from about 2014 could see uh, that democracy was under threat, that something interesting, something uh, strange was happening, uh, something new was happening that hadn't happened in India for a long time. And yet there was no declaration of emergency. There were no tanks on the streets of Delhi. The government had not taken over the, the broadcasting tower, right? Uh, free press was uh, theoretically still in place. The rights had not been suspended. Courts were still functioning. So how can you uh, claim that, uh, that there is any problem with, with democracy when it's business as usual. So, so this is a presentation based on a paper that's coming out in Law and Ethics of Human Rights, uh, I believe within a week's time. And I've called it Killing a Constitution with a Thousand Cuts because unlike the emergency that Mrs. Gandhi imposed on India in 1970s, um, this hasn't been an in your face full frontal assault on democracy and the system of separation of powers that, uh, that protects it. Uh, rather, the, the assault has been a lot more subtle, a lot more incremental, um, and a lot more insidious, uh, and therefore much harder to call out. So the attempt in the paper is to rise up to the scholarly challenge of, of pointing out the non-obvious. How do we know as scholars that this is not, look, all constitutional governments are mischievous, all constitutional governments are naughty, they all do things to benefit their own parties. How do we know that this is just, this is not just another one of those cases? Is it just a case that, you know, I don't like the ideology of this party in power and therefore I'm going to criticize it for killing democracy while I was silent when other governments did similar things. So the paper sort of attempts to give an account of why this is qualitatively different in the absence of clear markers of, uh, of democratic decline uh, in the traditional sense. There is no coup, there is no emergency. So what's, what's the problem? Right? Um, just as a quick background, um, India, uh, the constitution of 1950 recognizes separation of powers, not as an explicit principle, but it's embedded in the structures created by the constitution. It follows a similar trajectory to the Kenyan constitution uh, from what I understood from Dr. Ambani's uh, presentation with one key distinction, which is that India uh, follows a parliamentary system of democracy uh, rather than a presidential system. Um, uh, we see that as a good thing in India <laughs> largely, but that's also under threat. And I'll say why we see that as a good thing and why a personnel separation between the between the executive and the legislature is, uh, has largely been unwelcome in the progressive opinion uh, in India. Um, uh, and uh, the, the fourth branch uh, in the Indian constitution is less clearly recognized. The Kenyan constitution is a much more a contemporary sophisticated version of that. There are some early institutions like the Electoral Commission that are found in the constitution, but perhaps the Indian constitution does not go as far as it should have. In, uh, in protecting their autonomy. So um, before I uh, proceed, I just want to quickly recognize sort of theoretically, uh, this is mostly borrowing from Jeremy Waldron's work, but, uh, but Nick Barber, who's also on the panel has uh, especially uh, talked about the first of these three principles. I think we often have three different things in mind when we speak of separation of powers. We, uh, and this is also alluded to in Dr. Uh, Amani's uh, presentation. Um, uh, on the one hand, we talk about a functional uh, allocation of power to the institution that is most suited to perform that function, and that's what 
we think about the rule making and the rule application institutions, and then we divide the rule application institutions between the executive and the judiciary, et cetera. So that's one principle, and there the main guiding principle is that of effectiveness, or what Nick calls uh, the efficiency principle. Um, embedded in the principle is also the idea of non-concentration of power, that you know one institution, one group of individuals should not have too much power. This often uh, dictates the personnel separation idea that, that Dr. Amani talked about, but also that uh, you know, we should not put all state power in one single institution, that's bad for democracy. And finally, the accountability principle, what is often called checks and balances. I want to highlight that these principles can often pull in different directions. Uh, so sometimes the separation of personnel, not having ministers in parliament also means that they're not accountable to parliament and don't have to answer questions. So, so with that caveat in mind, I want to take you uh, quickly through uh, in, a snapshot of in Indian democracy between 2014 and 2019. That is the first term under Prime Minister Modi and how he managed to achieve um, what he did uh, despite not using any emergency powers. And I've called it in the title of the paper, um, in the subtitle, Executive Aggrandizement and Party State Fusion in India. So there are two two dimensions to this blueprint of autocratic takeover. One is the aggrandizement of the executive wing of government. By executive, I mean the political executive, the top higher executive, which is made up of uh, politicians, not, not so much the bureaucracy. Uh, the aggrandizement of the executive at the expense of other constitutional institutions. Um, the legislature, uh, the judiciary, also the states, by the way, in the federal system, and the fourth branch body. Um, and the second thing, which, which the separation of powers theory has still to fully articulate much more openly is, is the role of political parties. Um, you know, we're, we're still so uh, wedded to the Montesquieu uh, institutional separation of powers. We have just completely, well, I shouldn't say not completely not noticed because some, some scholars have written about it, but this is my new fascination. Thinking about the role of political parties and how that has completely scrambled the, the institutional separation of powers. And the second agenda has been the fusion uh, has, of the Modi government has been to seek a fusion between the party and the state, uh, which, which are the two, two ways in which uh, the government has sought to destroy democracy. Here's a quantitative uh, snapshot before I give you some qualitative points about India, which is, which is this is a graph of, <clears throat> of Indian uh, democracy in on four indicators. And you know, for whatever quantitative data is worth, you know, we all take it with a pinch of salt and rightly so. I, I just want to show you um, why this matters because if you see this big dip along the first. Uh, bar line, the first column around 1974-75, that coincides with the declaration of emergency uh, by Indira Gandhi. And you can see how all the indices uh, nosedive, they sort of go south, right? And at the end of the emergency, they start traveling up again and plateau, some, some, go re some do really well, like the uh, Election Commission Autonomy Index uh, really rises, right? The second bar line, no prizes for guessing, um, is uh, Mr. Modi coming into power. And we can see a more gradual decline, except in the ele Electoral Commission's autonomy uh, on all indices, but, but the trend is very clear. So this is, this is in some ways uh, the quantitative uh, uh, description of my qualitative thesis, that what we see here is exactly what's happened in practice, how the same objectives have been achieved uh, Neo-autocrats, as I've been calling them, 21st century autocrats, don't need 20th century tools of coups and, um, and uh, declarations of emergency because, because they can do all the things they want to do more subtly, more incrementally, uh, more sort of voce. Um, and I'll just uh, highlight what it is that they target by using the Indian example. So the three mechanisms that most constitutions have for for making the most dangerous branch, the executive branch accountable, which is electoral or vertical accountability, which is the accountability of the executive to the people through elections, through regular frequent elections, um, which should also be free and fair. Institutional or horizontal accountability, this is accountability to other state institutions, mainly in a democracy to the political opposition uh, in, in legislatures and in the states, but also to the judiciary and to fourth branch bodies. 
And finally, to uh, finally, the third prong of democracy, which uh, democratic accountability, which we don't talk, often talk about, but I think we should talk a lot more about it, is discursive or diagonal accountability. This is accountability to um, uh, to discursive institutions. They're not constitutional institutions, but very important for the maintenance of constitutional democracy. I think primary amongst them are media and universities, both tasked with seeking truth, but different types of truths. The media seeks more self-evident on the surface truths. Universities uh, seek more hidden uh, sort of under the surface truths, but they have a you know, role of speaking truth to power, but also other social institutions, including religious bodies, NGOs, trade unions, um, and a whole host of civil, what we call civil society bodies, which have an accountability function. And each of these accountability mechanisms have been chipped away by, uh, by Prime Minister Modi over the last uh, five, six years of power. So very briefly, and this is going to be a snapshot, you can look at the paper I've uh, collected all the evidence and I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants uh, who wants to get into the weeds. But broadly, the attacks on electoral democracy have been concentrated on three fronts. Um, <clears throat> there's an astonishingly ambitious uh, attempt to change India's demography, which is, uh, <clears throat> you know, you say uh, the people uh, get the government they deserve. Yet the government is trying to change who the people are, right, by, uh, <clears throat> by basically a, a calibrated and, and astonishingly large scale attempt to redefine Indian citizenship in, in, in a way that will exclude uh, a large number of Indian Muslims uh, from citizenship. I'm not going to go into the detail, but that is, that is truly astonishing. Uh, in terms of scale, it probably matches some of the worst governments of the, of the mid 20th century. Um, but it's again done ostensibly through a law abiding rule of law uh, mechanism of uh, citizenship. And this is again using uh, xenophobic arguments of the outsider insider. The second is campaign finance, uh, which has ma been made completely non-transparent. Again, Dr. Mani talked about uh, the role of money in politics, but um, uh, Mr. Modi, uh, again, through legislative uh, slate of hand, uh, slipped in amendments to the finance bill uh, you know, clause 123, finance bill is in, is in the public domain only for three, four days. The upper house cannot veto it. It has so many big uh, ticket issues in that you slip in an amendment to say political parties can get foreign funding completely anonymously. Uh, so donor anonymity uh, and value anonymity fully uh, guaranteed. Um, no prizes for guessing that 95% of that money has gone to the ruling party uh, in the in the latest figures that were available. The third is electoral scheduling, which is that Mr. Modi has been trying to, to mess with, uh, has been mooting a, a rescheduling of electoral system in India. It's called one country, one vote. The main point of the idea, India is a parliamentary democracy. Parliamentary democracy is a part of uh, India's uh, basic structure, cannot be changed. Uh, every autocrat in India has wanted a presidential system. They can't have it because of the basic structure doctrine. They want to do it through a different mechanism by fixing parliamentary terms so that even if the ruling party loses the majority in parliament to stay in office effectively until the next electoral date, which is in practice a presidential system. And it's, you know, across the world, it's been every autocrat's wet dream to, 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 to move to a presidential system. So, so uh, anyway, I, I see that I'm running really close uh, to finishing my time. Um, so I'll, I'll skip over the, the, the other two dimensions of eroding uh, institutional democracy, which is largely targeted um, the opposition, the political opposition, non-recognition of leader of opposition, undermining bicameralism until the ruling party gets majority in the upper house, completely sidelining by using the money bill method, labeling every bill to be a money bill, unfair legislative processes using the guillotine to, to, to rule out uh, opposition, attacking federalism, abusing uh, all sorts of constitutional emergency provisions to sideline state governments, sidelining the cabinet. Judicial and fourth branch capture has been again sort of voce, it's what I've been calling soft capture. So there isn't a clear in your face attempt to take over. It's been done behind the scenes through threats, through blackmail, through um, uh, inducements, buying out, dangling jobs, post-retirement, uh, things like that. And, and the most vicious front has been on the civil society where there is no pretense of legality. It's been a clear, naked, blatant use of force, use of legal force, abuse of legal force. So, you know, all governments have used in the past um, 
defamation law, this government uses sedition law. So an academic against the, the, the party becomes the state, quite literally the party is becoming the state. And therefore, if you attack the party, it's seen as sedition, it's challenged as sedition. Uh, the process becomes a punishment. You spend five years in prison. You sometimes die in prison. You're tortured, killed, etc. So, uh, so it's 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 really dire. And while you can find a precedent for almost everything at some scale in a previous government, its concentration in these five years is is new territory. No government has managed to get away with all of this. So, what's the take home point from all of this? I just quickly um, say a few things. Uh, the only thing that has managed to stand up against the government has been political, right? So uh, I think as constitutionalists, we've spent, we set far too much hope in unelected checks on government in the judiciary and fourth branch governments. They are really powerless. Uh, as if the threat is real, if the threat of backlash is real, they can do very little to save their legitimacy uh, as long as they remain independent. And after they become captured, even if softly captured, they become handmaidens of the executive government. So then they become a very dangerous tool. So all the opposition, you know, the political opposition of the Canary in the coal mine, they smell autocracy first because they are the most invested in a democratic system. And therefore, uh, I think all solutions have to be thought of in terms of empowering the political opposition and entrenching the separation of parties and state, especially the ruling party and the state. So, so the attacks have been by, you know, bicameralism, parliamentary system and federalism have been the most vulnerable, but they're also the spaces that need to be strengthened by recognizing a much more st stronger role for opposition rights. And finally, uh, this is something I'm working on, thinking about the fourth branch body, uh, fourth branch of the state as what I'm thinking of calling the guarantor branch. It guarantees constitutional promises, um, including that of democracy. Uh, and in design terms, it has to be thought of not as a non-partisan branch, but as a post-partisan branch, a branch in which the opposition has an, a co-equal say um, uh, as that of the ruling party and therefore makes it impossible for its capture uh, hard or soft. So uh, I'm, I'm over my time by a minute, so I'll stop there and thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot, uh, Tarun. A lot of uh, issues that you that you raise, and I can see we already have some great questions um, specifically on um, what you've spoken on. Please keep sharing your questions. Um, you can access the uh, Q&A section on the bottom bar of your screen, uh, and um, these will be collated and uh, shared with the with the panelists in the in the second half. So our next uh, speaker is Kate, and she is speaking with, um, you know, a long experience of the South African uh, constitutional uh, system. Uh, she uh, is the inaugural director of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights uh, at the University of Oxford, and she uh, served as a as a judge in in South Africa for fifteen years, um, and also has quite a bit of experience across the continent, um, including in countries like Namibia, uh, and also advising civil society and NGOs. So it would be interesting to hear from her on um, on South Africa and what their challenges have looked like. So welcome to Kate. Thanks very much, Makami. I'm going to try and share my screen and see if that works. Um, does that look good? Um, so I'm going to talk about the separation of powers in the South African constitution and there are certainly some themes that come through from the, um, from the earlier presentations uh, uh, in regard to what I'm going to say. Um, I've, I've um, used the background of the Constitutional Court for, in uh, Johannesburg. For those of you who haven't visited the court, these are all the images in the PowerPoint are from the Constitutional Court, from parts of the Constitutional Court. So for those of you who uh, want to look at something rather than listen, um, there, there are some pictures. So in the outline of my talk, a little bit um, like Ambani and Tarun, I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of the separation of powers, but I, I disagree with them relatively little, so um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. And then I'm going to talk about aspects of the constitutional structure in South Africa. Um, I'm going to particularly focus on the special role of the court, and it's not only because I've served on the court, but because I think in some ways it has become a a key focus for thinking about the separation of powers in South Africa uh, over the last uh, 15 years in particular. Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly about the political, social and economic context because it does seem to me that thinking about 
separation of powers needs us to think about political, social and economic context. And then I'm going to talk about the jurisprudence of the court and what was called in one of the early decisions of the court, the development of a distinctively South African model of the separation of powers and talk about some early landmark decisions and decisions from the last three years. So um, turning then to the concept, um, if we look at the sort of 18th century development of the concept of the separation of powers, one finds whether one looks at Montesquieu or Madison or Locke, uh, as, as both Ambani and, um, and Tarun mentioned, this idea of the focus on the concentration of power um, and the need to avoid tyranny. And in many ways, if one thinks about the era in which they were writing, which was the era of moving away from absolute monarchies in many cases, um, the fear of tyranny was the was what really informed um, the thinking about separation of powers, as did their conception of the role of the state. And I think it's important today to realize that the role of the state in the 21st century in most of our societies is very different to the role of the state in the 18th century. Um, its uh, involvement in our daily lives, its guarantee of um, basic services to citizens, um, means that the state is a, a different sort of phenomenon. And I'd suggest that if we're thinking about the conception of the separation of powers for the 21st century, although of course we are concerned about tyranny and um, concentration of power, as both Ambani and Tarun's presentations make clear, we also don't want to paralyze the state. We do want the state to be able to carry out the functions of a modern contemporary state. And perhaps our thinking therefore uh, needs to be both around control and around facilitation. Um, there are, of course, and again, uh, my next slide um, is quite similar to Tyron's slide, and I also draw a little bit on Waldron's work here in recognizing that within the conception of the modern uh, separation of powers, there are three closely linked ideas. The idea of institutional uh, and functional separation between normally the three arms of government, legislature, executive and judiciary, um, but also um, the, so that there's both a separation between the actual institutions which can be in personnel, something that Ambani talked about, but also about the way in which they work. Then there's the avoidance of concentration of power, which of course to some extent comes through in what one saw in Locke and, and Madison and Montesquieu. And then finally this idea of accountability, of checks and balances, of um, coordination nation and compromise between the different arms of government to carry out a particular function or the acting independently to constrain or channel the acts of another branch. For most of us who are interested in comparative constitutional design it's the third part of this that's very interesting and I think that the conversation we'll have today will make us want to go back to the drawing board and think about that. I mean, one, one of the things that Tarun has talked about is the importance of the opposition. Generally not something that many comparative constitutional lawyers think about when they're thinking about checks and balances in modern constitutional frameworks, but it may well be that we need to be rethinking about that in the light of um, the ways in which separation of powers is emerging in the, in the early 21st century. So turning then to um, South Africa's constitutional structure, uh, um, it has many similarities uh, with Kenya, although of course we have a provincial structure where Kenya has the county structure, um, and it's quite difficult to give a full overview in the short time available to me. But there are just a few points that I thought were important to pick out. The first is that our legislature has two houses, uh, the National Assembly, which is elected by popular vote on the basis of a system of proportional representation um, and a list system, so a very strict system of proportional representation. And then our upper house is the National Council of Provinces, which draws its representatives from the legislatures of each of the provinces who are elected in separate elections also on the basis of proportional representation. So the government is divided into three spheres then, national, and that's the language of the constitution, it talks about three spheres, I think trying to avoid the language in some ways of hierarchy or division. And the three spheres are national, provincial and local, although the constitution emphasizes that we are indeed a unitary state. Nevertheless, um, both provincial and local spheres of government do have some um, areas of competence which are exclusive to them 
but the vast majority of provincial um, areas of competence are shared with the national government and then there is a procedure for determining um, which, for, which, uh, which shall take precedence where there's a conflict between them. And that is a matter that's decided by the Constitutional Court if, 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 if it arises. The next thing to note is that we are in a we are really a parliamentary system. The president of South Africa, who's called the president, not the prime minister, is elected by the National Assembly from amongst its members. So the president must be on one of the lists um, of the political parties in the electoral process, and then is elected at the first sitting of the National Assembly by a secret ballot, and a ballot which is provided over by the Chief Justice. You see there, I think, some of the elements of checks and balances in, in relation to the appointment of the president. Once the president is elected, however, he or she will no longer be a member of the National Assembly, loses membership of the National Assembly and becomes a president alone. And we, the president does um, present a state of the nation address uh, in the National Assembly, but is not unlike in a pure parliamentary system, does not remain a member of the National Assembly. The president also may be removed by a two-thirds vote of the National Assembly on grounds of a serious violation of the Constitution or serious misconduct, and also may be required to resign if the National Assembly, by a majority, a simple majority, passes a motion of no confidence. So there you see the ordinary parliamentary system. The former process of removal is one that is, um, in, a, in a sense, a disciplinary process. And I'm going to come back to both these uh, issues uh, in, a little, in, a, in a moment. Um, finally, I think it's important to note that we have a very strong form of constitutional democracy in uh, South Africa with Section 2 being a constitutional supremacy clause that any law or conduct that is inconsistent with the Constitution is invalid and must be declared to be invalid if it is uh, challenged before the Constitutional Court. And the um, model of our constitutional democracy gives a special role in the separation of powers to the Constitutional Court. Um, I haven't mentioned on the slide, but it is an important aspect of our constitution, just as Ambani spoke of the chapter 15 institutions in the Kenyan constitution. South Africa has a range of institutions which it claims are to support constitutional democracy established in terms of chapter nine of our constitution. They include the Electoral Commission, the Auditor General, the um, Human Rights Commission, and the public protector, who is a form of ombud under our constitution, uh, with, with strong constitutionally based powers and functions um, to protect constitutional democracy. So that's a brief outline of aspects of the South African constitutional structure. And I want to turn now to um, talk about the special role of the constitutional court. It is the only court that can give effect to declarations of invalidity of national or provincial legislation. So that although other courts may make a, a, come to the conclusion and make a finding that a piece of legislation is inconsistent with the constitution, any order made by that court must be confirmed by the constitutional court. There are elements here, I think, of the Kelsenian model of, um, of constitutional courts in recognizing this special role of the Constitutional Court. But unlike in the original pure Calcinian model, there is a very wide uh, standing clause, again, um, not dissimilar to the standing clause in the Kenyan Constitution, which grants a very wide array, array of organizations uh, to bring cases before the Constitutional Court. So that's distinctly un in character. The Constitutional Court is the only court that can determine the constitutional challenges to conduct of the President or to Parliament, and I'm going to turn to some of those in a moment, but um, it has exclusive, therefore, areas of exclusive jurisdiction where matters cannot be brought before other courts. And this special, as it were, separation of powers role of the court is reflected in the appointment procedures to the court and in the terms of office of members of the court. So there are different procedures for appointment to the Constitutional Court and a greater role for the President in selecting members of the Constitutional Court than in relation to other courts uh, in South Africa. Um, in particular, where there is a vacancy on the court, the Judicial Service Commission, which is a constitutionally mandated body to call for and interview nominees for judicial appointment, 
must provide the president with three more names than the number of vacancies on the court from which the president selects after he consults both with the leader of the opposition and with the leader of the judiciary, the chief justice. Um, so that means that if there's one vacancy on the court, four names are forwarded to the president. If there are two, five names. And this is um, clearly recognizing, it's a check and balance system, recognizing the special powers of the court. The terms of the office of the court are also unusual in that more like a continental system, there's a maximum term of office of 15 years for those people who are appointed to the court from uh, um, having served as judges on other courts for more than three years, that term is 12 years. And um, so in relation to me, when I was appointed, I served 15 because I hadn't been a judge before. But the vast majority of people who are appointed to the court are actually appointed from the judiciary and they serve 12 years of office, at which stage they must resign. So finally, before turning to talk a little bit about the jurisprudence of the court, I, I want to talk a little bit about the political, social and economic context. And that image is taken from um, a place in the court where the President Mandela's speech from the dock uh, at the Rivonia trial in the 1960s is. And it was um, where he was talking about the ideal of democracy. It's an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but it need, if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. And that's an important sort of background to thinking about our political, social, and economic context. The legacy of apartheid and colonialism have led deep patterns of racial inequality in South Africa that have really shifted remarkably little despite 25 years in the post of a post-apartheid government. There are also very deep patterns of poverty in South Africa. We're a deeply unequal society where um, we have very wealthy people and a very large number of poor people, most of whom, but not exclusively, are black South Africans. Secondly, we've seen very weak economic growth, particularly since the financial crisis of 2008. There was some period of growth in the um, late 90s and particularly early 2000s, but since 2008, we're one of the economies in the world that has seen very weak patterns of economic growth. And that, of course, has meant that shifting the patterns of racial inequality and poverty have proved very difficult. And finally, we have, um, I think politically, a single party dominance electorally. The African National Congress, one of the liberation movements that um, led the struggle or was key to the struggle against apartheid, has formed the national government in South Africa without a break since 1994, and also has formed the government, forms currently the government in eight of nine provinces. And in fact, there are only two provinces uh, that haven't been uh, governed by the African National Congress, Congress um, persistently since 1994. So this is a sort of brief look at the political, social and economic context of South Africa. Turning then to um, the separation of powers as it's been interpreted and developed by the Constitutional Court. Um, I've used as the title to this section, this language of a distinctively South African model of the separation of powers, which comes from a judgment of my colleague, Justice Ackerman in 1997, where he said that over time, the courts would develop a model of the separation of powers, one that fits the particular system of government provided for in the constitution and that reflects a delicate balancing informed both by South Africa's history and its new dispensation between the need on the one hand to control government by separating powers and enforcing checks and balances, and on the other to avoid diffusing power so completely that the government is unable to take timely measures in the public interest. And that's something we think about now during the COVID-19 crisis, where we recognize how important it is that government is able to act quickly and respons responsively in order to address the crisis. But on the other hand, we also don't want to end up in a situation where government has powers that are, um, that are concentrated and uh, subject to abuse. So I think when commentators looked at the powers of the Constitutional Court early on, what attracted them most was the powers of the court under the Bill of Rights. It's a very strong Bill of Rights. Again, in this we share a lot of similarities with the Kenyan Constitution. It includes both civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights and compels the court to make declarations of invalidity where legislation or conduct of the government is in breach of those rights. So, and indeed, the court has been very active in the field of human rights 
perhaps where there was less thought that this would become, um, it would, that the powers of the court would be significant are in relation to the relationships with the other branches of government. There was thought that the court may be very active in relation to provincial legislation and separating or uh, allocating responsibilities between national and provincial government. But in fact, there's been relatively little litigation around that. And that may well be partly because of our um, single party dominant system of politics, where there's relatively little conflict between provinces and national government. But an area that was not predicted, as I've said, I think, was the area of the relationship um, uh, the courts, um, in some ways, uh, oversight or engagement with the powers of both the presidency and parliament. But right early on in 1995, um, we began to see that this in fact may become an important area of the court's jurisprudence and may contribute to this distinctively modern uh, South African model of the separation of powers with a declaration which related to local government elections in 1995 that declared the, um, a power and the exercise of that power by President Mandela to amend legislation to be in breach of the constitutional manner and form provisions regulating the making of legislation. It's very interesting that at that moment when President Mandela was told that what he'd done under this legislat legislative provision was unconstitutional, he chose immediately to go onto national television and say, he completely endorsed the decision of the court, accepted it, and would recall Parliament to amend the legislation in the necessary way. So right from the start, we, President Mandela created a very strong kind of role model of acceptance of the court's role in regulating uh, the powers of the presidency. Um, we then saw in 2006 an important decision in which the court declared that Parliament's obligation to facilitate public involvement in the legislative processes was justiciable and a failure to do so may render legislation invalid. Um, for those schooled in Westminster systems, this willingness of the court to engage in the processes pursued by Parliament seems to be, uh, it is novel and um, uh, in some ways a kind of an alarming departure from the classic understanding of the relationship between courts and Parliament um, that one finds in the UK constitution. But that's been an important part of the jurisprudence of the court has been its willingness to engage uh, in relation to the way in which Parliament conducts itself as well. We've also seen the courts quite early on in 2012 declaring uh, be, being engaged in the processes of appointment of um, senior uh, um, officers, uh, constitutional officers really, uh, by the presidency. Um, the Many of the positions that are constitutionally significant, the president has a role in the appointment. And we saw with the appointment of a national director of public prosecutions in 2012, where the court held that the president's decision to appoint somebody who had been had adverse findings against him um, by a commission of inquiry meant that the process was not rational and the decision was therefore invalid. Those early decisions have led, led in the last three years to uh, um, a kind of a greater um, number of decisions of this sort. Um, there was um, a decision in 2017 where the court held that a vote of no confidence in the president may be taken by secret ballot, which uh, is something that the Speaker of Parliament had been uh, had thought was not possible. Um, a decision in 2018 um, whereby the court held that the failure by the National Assembly to establish rules for a procedure to assess whether the president's conduct amounts to an impeachable offence was unconstitutional and the National Assembly was put on terms to establish rules for such a procedure, although there was a strong, there was strong dissent in that decision, including one by the current Chief Justice, asserting that this decision of the court was in fact um, a judicial overreach. And finally, a decision of the court also in 2018 finding that the signing of the 2014 protocol on the 20, on the SADC tribunal, which effectively prevented appointments to the tribunal and disabled it, was held to be unconstitutional in 2018. So we're seeing a range um, that, that, of course, had been signed by the president. We're seeing a growing range then of judicial decisions by the Constitutional Court in particular around the, it, um, the powers um, and functions of the of Parliament on the one hand and the presidency on the other. And um, the question I ask is whether this is a distinctively South African model of the separation of powers. And I think also the question is 
whether this is a, uh, it's an interesting question, whether this is a response to what Tyron has described as a kind of 21st century enthusiasm for executive aggrandizement in democracies in many parts of the world. Um, it has put back onto the front burner the need to constrain the concentration of power, as M Madison and Montesquieu argued, and whether these are appropriate levels of constraints. But it, we should not forget that we also need to enable government to act so that the promise of the South African Constitution's preamble, which is to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person, is not lost. This does require a sensitive and imaginative balance to be found. And I think that we're still in the process of determining um, whether the balance that the court is seeking to achieve uh, is one which will indeed bring about the vision of the constitution. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kate. And um, the, the closing point on, on balancing the constraining of power and uh, the, the enabling of, of power, I think goes to both um, Dr. Ambani's and Tarun's presentation. So I'm hoping later we can hear from them uh, how that kind of balance can be can be achieved. So our last uh, speaker is uh, Professor Paul uh, Craig. He is a professor uh, in English law at the University of Oxford and uh, a fellow um, at St. John's uh, College. He will be speaking on the uh, challenges in the United Kingdom. I'm aware the United Kingdom has a much longer constitutional history in in terms of the current state um, as compared to the other contexts that we have um, heard from. Uh, so uh, a big welcome to to uh, Paul. <clears throat> Thank you so much um, Mukami. Thank you very much. It's a great great pleasure to be here. Let me just try and share my screen with you. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, I am here to say a few words in the time I have available about concepts of separation of powers in the UK. And of course, um, when you come forth in the list, it's almost inevitable that some of the things that you were going to say have been said elegantly and eloquently by other speakers. Um, but uh, just giving you a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to say a few words at the beginning about general, the general theory of the separation of powers and then look at some of the contemporary challenges in the UK. Um, so much of what I have to say about the theory has been said both eloquently and elegantly by others, the other speakers already so I will just go back a little bit further, perhaps, in terms of ideas of dividing different functions of government. We find it go, we find evidence and uh, important traces of this, both in Plato's laws and in the Aristotelian work on politics, where both of those giants talked about different functions performed by the state and criteria for the elaboration of those functions. And then, of course, those ideas were picked up and developed, in particular by writers such as Locke. And then we had the famous Montesquieu triadic division between legislative, executive and judicial, which has been spoken about thus far. The only point I would add uh, to what has been said in that regard is the fact that certainly in the UK, alongside that classic discussion or discourse concerning the separation of powers, which culminated at least in historical terms with the Montesquieu triadic division, there was also a sort of parallel or overlapping discourse concerning institutional balance of power, which is which features prominently in the work of Harrington in the 17th century, in the work of Delorme in the 18th century, and indeed it's very prominent in the work of Blackstone. So for example, Blackstonian conceptions of the sovereignty of parliament are explicitly 
and I mean explicitly, predicated on assumptions about an institutional balance between the three branches of government as he, as he saw it, monarchy, aristocracy, and commons, and these were the three branches. And interestingly, Blackstone was only willing to accept or to recognize that Parliament was sovereign if there was an institutional balance between those three different branches of government. And indeed, he spent 25 pages before the famous conclusion about sovereignty telling us how, in his view, such a, an institutional balance did indeed exist in the 18th century. Whether indeed it did in the way that he said is a different matter. Again, the dual rationale has been spoken about already, and I can go over this very quickly. We have both a functional rationale predicated on two related assumptions that different skills or people are required for legislating, executing laws and adjudicating on them, and that overall the system functions better when those functions are performed by different institutions. And then we have, of course, the famous prevention of tyranny rationale or the non-concentration rationale, as Tarim put it, that if the functions of legislating, executing laws and then adjudicating on laws were combined in the same institution, then that would lead to tyranny almost inevitably. The dominant party could enact laws for its own benefit. It could execute laws or apply them in the way most advantageous to it. And if the application of the laws was challenged, then it could adjudicate on laws and give an interpretation thereto that supported those uh, that supported the view that it wished to propound. And of course, that prevention of tyranny rationale is still a very important one. Um, it was elaborated on both by Montesquieu, Madison and Locke, but of course it's still an incredibly important one and some of the wiring developments in countries uh, which are members of the EU in Eastern Europe stand stark testimony to the dangers of concentration of power and the erosion or the independence of the judiciary, particularly in Hungary and in Poland. Um, briefly then, the theory, of the, the approach about the separation of powers is of course based upon certain empirical and normative assumptions, particularly in the UK, can governmental functions be divided into three neat category writers in the UK, such as Marshall and Jennings, have questioned whether that was feasible not necessarily in the abstract, but certainly in the UK context. And those concerns have perhaps been greater or become greater with the rise of the fourth branch of government and the rise of the administrative state and the rise of agencies which combine both the capacity for administrative rulemaking and adjudication of the kind that, we're, that, that is uh, common in many countries. Less obvious, but perhaps more important, but equally important, is can the individual powers of the different branches be defined accurately? So the separation of powers rests implicitly or implicitly on the assumption that the con constituent functional elements, legislative, executive, and judicial, can indeed be defined with some precision, thereby allowing us to differentiate between them. That is more complex than imagined, especially in relation to executive power. It's actually, I think, not fortuitous that pretty much in every constitution which has, uh, which I've looked at or which I've um, read about, the definition of executive power is actually one of the weakest elements within the constitutional framework. And that's in part because there's this duality in the very definition of what we mean by executive power. Executive power connotes two related but distinct ideas. One is that the idea that the executive has to some extent or to a greater extent 
um, than is often imagined, the very power to set policy and the agenda for that society. And it's also responsible for implementation. And that, that duality in the meaning of executive power is present in all systems and is part of the reason why the executive, why there's a tendency or a danger that it could become, that it can aggrandize power to an extent that becomes worrying. So on then to the, well, the second half of this, very briefly then, in the time I have available, let me just put down some of the issues. And I can't elaborate on each of these. Each of these could take a whole hour or whatever. But let me at least put them down in terms of the kinds of separation of powers issues that arise in the UK. And I'm not claiming that this is an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty big list anyway. So if you think about it, there are three sets of relationship, legislature and courts, legislature and the executive, and courts and the executive. And each of those three sets of relationships uh, generates separation of powers issues. And we have, uh, there are issues concerning each of those sets of relationship in the UK. So, there have been discussions in the UK about the appointment of judges. We modified or transformed our method of appointing judges in the not too distant past. Uh, issues about how we should appoint judges and who should be on the appointing bodies is, a per, is, is still an issue. We've, there's issues about the interference with judges or judicial decision making in terms of criticism of judges, sometimes captious by not so much the legislature in this context, often uh, by a member of the executive that is dissatisfied with the way in which the court has ruled. And of course, we have an unequal fight here in a sense that the judges aren't actually capable of responding to that criticism, or they simply don't do so. Parliamentary privilege, is another area where the boundaries between legislature and courts are raised. Indeed, so too, of course, most prominently is the legitimacy of constitutional review. Now in the UK, we don't have a uh, hard edge constitutional review of the kind which exists in many other countries, both common law and civil law, um, but we do have a softer form of constitutional Constitutional review, which is embodied in the Human Rights Act of 1998. There are issues about the boundary line between hard and soft constitutional review, and there's much academic discussion about whether courts do or are going beyond their accepted remit. I do not believe there are, um, but there's a big debate about that. Just to show the uh, salience of this inquiry of this issue, the Conservative government, the present Conservative government, announced in its manifesto that it was going to have a commission stroke inquiry into law and democracy, in which it was going to be looking at the balance of power of courts and parliament. It was unclear until recently, partly because of the pandemic and Brexit, whether that commission would indeed uh, be set up. Um, but uh, in a very recent appearance before a House of Lords Select Committee, it's now clear from the Justice Secretary that the, um, that the commission is indeed going to be established. It's not clear what its brief will be, and it's not clear what its remit will be but it will be happening. So the balance of power between legislature and courts is going to be a real issue going forward in the next six months or a year. And then of course, we have issues, the second pair of relationship, executive and courts and key issues. 
we have issues of structural constitutional review dividing where the courts are asked to divide the line or draw the line between executive and legislative power that has been that was exemplified very prominently by the first miller case in the supreme court and so too albeit in a different way by the second miller case the prorogation case um, uh, and again much divided academic opinion on those i believe that the supreme court got it right in both cases other people do not then of course there are other issues um, there are issues concerning the duty of the executive and particular um, uh, particular members of the executive to support the judiciary when they are faced by captious criticism from the media uh, exemplified by the reaction or the very tardy reaction of the executive uh, when there was the famous or infamous enemies of the people headline in one of the prominent daily newspapers and the fact that it took the government really some time to say anything about this at all. And then of course we have judicial review of power of the executive and prominent questions, separation of powers questions about that. All I want to say about that for the moment is simply the following. Judicial review, of course, is designed in part to ensure that the executive stays within the remit accorded to it by Parliament. In all our theorizing about the nature of administrative law and what it's about, we forget that fundamental fact or normative precept at our peril. And of course, we are all cognizant of the limits to such judicial power, and the courts are the court should not interfere too far with a power accorded to the executive by parliament and i think that on the whole our courts are very well aware of that doesn't mean that there aren't decisions which are sometimes controversial but in a systemic or structural sense it's my strong view that the courts are fully aware of the limits of their power as attested to by the tight control that they keep on the extent to which they will review discretionary power either at common law or under the hra the final sec the final slide um, uh, is about the third set of set of relationships parliament and the executive um, so well i'm not sure no it's uh, my penultimate slide so what we have witnessed one of the perennial problems in a parliamentary system or issues is the balance of power between the executive and the parliament in relation to the passage of legislation and that is it is a perennial issue as attested to by the fact that there have been even if you look at the period of time say for the last 40 years there have been countless uh, House of Commons select, uh, select committee reports about trying to ensure that Parliament does have a proper say in the passage of legislation and that that's part of its constitutional function. Um, and of course there is a tension between the desire of the executive to get through its legislative agenda on the one hand and the desire for proper parliamentary scrutiny of that legislation on the other so what the contemporary situation has generated is a perfect storm as it were the perfect storm being a combination of brexit on the one hand and the pandemic crisis on the other and in that perfect storm we see that the capacity of parliament to exercise its legislative function to scrutinize legislation and raise points about the wisdom or content of legislation has been uh, really quite radically limited both in relation to primary legislation and a fortiori or even more so in relation to secondary legislation so brexit generated a huge range under the eu withdrawal act of 2018 a huge volume of business for the uh, 
for Parliament, mainly in the form of statutory instruments, which were going to domesticate EU legislation, in particular in the form of regulations and decisions. And the volume was very significant indeed. And even if we hadn't had the pandemic crisis, the difficulties of ensuring that that was done with any modicum of legislative oversight was going to be a, uh, a difficult sell or a difficult thing to achieve. The pandemic, of course, has rendered that even uh, more difficult. And indeed, um, the passage of both primary legislation and regulations under the pandemic have tested Parliament's capacity to the full. So, um, this is my final slide. What is also interesting, still sticking to this issue about the separation of powers issues concerning the legislature and the executive, is that, of course, the legislature does have a related but separate function, and the related but separate function is a scrutiny function. It's always been regarded as part of the job of Parliament to scrutinise the executive ex post facto. And actually, our Parliament has a very good tradition in that respect, both in terms of House of Commons select committees and select committees of the House of Lords, which engage in detailed scrutiny of government, issue, uh, government initiatives. Now, what's interesting is that while there is, I think, no a priori connection between limited legislative input by Parliament into the content of legislation itself and greater ex post scrutiny through select committees, I think there is nonetheless some real causal connection between the two. To put the point uh, succinctly, other things being equal, the more Parliament, the legislature, is crabbed and confined or excluded de facto from a role in supervising or having input into, real input into, the content of legislation or the content of executive action, then I think the more the legislature quite rightly prizes its ability to engage in quite detailed scrutiny of the actions of the executive through select committees. And we see two very prominent examples of that in the recent last couple of weeks in the UK. We had the Intelligence and Security Committee report on Russia and the influence of Russia during the elections. And then we had the Public Accounts Committee report on government handling of the economic dimensions of the pandemic crisis. So, uh, I think my time is up and let me stop there. As I said, it's been a very great pleasure taking part in this and I look forward to listening to and hearing some of the questions. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Paul. That, that was a, a, um, a very interesting uh, discussion of the United Kingdom position. And thank you indeed to all of the speakers for um, a fascinating discussion of those different experiences from different constitutional orders. I've been told, I was told at the start that there was a, a three line whip that we absolutely had to finish at 12. So that means we're gonna to have to be reasonably brisk with the questions, um, um, I'm afraid. Um, I thought rather than try to go through and read out the questions, I've read them through and I thought maybe I could point to some broad themes that seem to arise in the questions and then put them back to the speakers for, for comment. So, um, Maybe we'll have a second round, but in this first round, there are three things I, I wanted to raise from the questions. The first was, and this is something I think that came through all of the presentations, was the judges as political actors. How do the judges as political actors fit in to our model of separation of powers? Now, there's an older style of um, academic lawyer who believed that judges didn't make political decisions, that they were in some sense uh, uh, neutral 
uh, uh, um, above and separate from politics. I don't think any of the speakers here, I think, would believe that the judges were separate from politics, that they didn't make political decisions. But I think that the separation of powers perhaps means that the type of political decisions they make are made differently and perhaps are made in a narrower realm. So I wondered what the speakers thought about this. Does the separation of powers speak to the judge's political role? Does it speak to the relationship between the type of questions we want judges to answer and the type of led questions we want legislatures to answer? One of the questions that has been raised by the, um, the audience was the connections between judges and autocratic regimes. What should a judge do when faced with an autocratic regime? And I think I'd like, perhaps controversially, to broaden this out. What should judges do when faced with regimes that are, how should we say, decreasingly respectful of judges? And this is perhaps something we see in the United Kingdom the last, the last year or so. Um, a, a, a political regime that's increasingly willing to play hardball with the judges, less uh, respectful and deferential. How can the judges maintain their position in the constitutional order? How can they maintain their independence in the constitutional order in a system which is perhaps much, becoming much harder for them to maintain that role? And the final line of thought along this line, we've talked about the relationship between the courts and the executive. One of the um, the secrets, perhaps, of our, our, our constitutions, something that we tend not to want to face up to directly, is that the power of the judges is almost entirely, not entirely, but almost entirely dependent on the executive. The judges rely on the executive to um, enforce their judgments. The judges rely ultimately on the executive to honor rulings that are given against the executive. And I thought Kate brought this out very well with that quote from uh, Nelson Mandela. We, we do rely very heavily on the executive to, 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 to keep the judges running. How can the constitution balance or, or, or maintain judicial independence and also judicial reliance on the executive? How does that work? The second group of questions um, that I picked up on relate to the spirit of the constitution. Um, do constitutions have a spirit? And if so, where is the spirit of a constitution to be found? Is it, is it located in the rules and principles of a constitution? Does it rise up in some way out of those um, um, principles? By the way, when I was saying that, I sounded cynical and sceptical. I'm not. I think there is such a thing as the spirit of the constitution. I think there are ideologies that uh, uh, um, we can attribute to constitutions. But the question of how those ideologies and that spirit should be made use of by the courts, by the judges, and by the legislature, I think is a very interesting um, and difficult separation of powers question. And linking back to that first strand of questions, does the rise in constitutional hardball mean that we should be more cautious about um, um, the invocation of um, the spirit of the constitution as something we want to see used by the courts and by the constitution in general? Um, Ambami raised this, the idea of constitutional intelligence, the need to create a constitution that can function in a, 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 an age in which perhaps people are more willing to make use of their discretion in, in a, a, a way antithetical towards the courts in the way they weren't before. And a final line of thought on this line of questioning, another question that was raised in the, the, from, the, from the, um, um, the audience was the colonial legacy of um, the constitutional models in um, India and Kenya. And I suppose we could also say South Africa. Um, and as I was thinking about um, the spirit of the constitution, and I was thinking about the colonial legacy, I wonder if Westminster's uh, moment, as it were, around the first part of the last century, when there was quite a, a homogenous political community that could regulate itself through consensus, through agreement, through a general, generally accepted sense of what was appropriate and what inappropriate. Is, is that um, one of the uh, malign legacies that the Westminster model of the constitution has left to other constitutions, that there was just that brief moment when that sort of constitutionalism worked, and yet lots of constitutions around the world have been left with, saddled with this model. Uh, 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 um. The final line of questions, the fourth branch. I think this is something that a number of the speakers touched on and has come up in a number of the, the comments. What is the fourth branch? Um, 
do we need to now have a separate category in the separation of powers to catch things like electoral commissions, central banks, um, auditors, maybe even the army? Um, is this a distinct type of um, autonomy and independence that we need to find ways constitutionally of protecting? Potentially, going back to the very start of these line of questions, is it a way of trying to create uh, uh, um, um, organizations that have some control over coercive power, um, but which are separate from the executive to some degree and some extent? Okay, well, I'm gonna put those questions now to the panel. Um, don't try under any circumstances to answer them all, panel. Otherwise, we'll be here well past uh, 12 o'clock. But if you could pick up on a few of those thoughts, I'd be grateful. And let's start where we started this morning with Ambami. So, Ambami, first of all. Well, thank you. Um, that's an interview, not a question. <laughs> that's, that's a serious interview. <laughs> it's beyond questions. Um, if I could just mention quickly on, on each, quickly, um, are judges political actors? I think uh, Justice Kate or Reagan is in a better position, but I, I could say um, that looking at the emerging constitutions, for example, in Africa, um, they appear to be constitutionalizing constitutional questions, and judges inevitably will find that they have to respond to politics. Um, I think wisdom should guide the judges in this, um, to know when to meddle and to know when not. Um, when I look, for instance, at separation of powers and uh, socioeconomic rights, I think that judges in a country like ours, Kenya or South Africa, uh, must get involved there, even though those are policy questions uh, typical for the executive. The situation of the people is such that the judges will do good, will do justice to be involved. Um, what about a presidential election contest? I think judges must tread carefully there. Um, as Kenyans' uh, own situation explains, uh, because we have had election petitions nearly in every election that we have held under the new constitution. In 2013, the judiciary, I think, uh, uh, traded carefully, refused to declare the constitution invalid. In 2017, the Su Supreme Court was bold enough to say the election is um, invalid and unconstitutional, but the repercussions are there for everyone to see. First, the executive decided to fight back, to revisit the issue, uh, cut their budget, frustrate them completely. And second, that the people that were being served, the opposition political party led by Raila Odinga, soon thereafter shook hands with the ruling party. And in fact, uh, you know, experts or those in the know say, that the conversations were ongoing even as the election petition was happening. So the judges were just being used to nullify an election, which didn't mean anything other than to negotiate for more power by the opposition. In that case, I think maybe wisdom on the part of the judiciary would determine which cases to take and which one not to take. I think that, that is my position on that. Do constitutions have a spirit? I believe yes. And for me, the spirit lies somewhere in the struggle especially for emerging constitutions. Um, I believe that a transformative constitution is only possible after a struggle, a proper struggle, where the people fight for something, like apartheid in South Africa, uh, like genocide in Rwanda. And, and, and that creates the conditions that enable the constitution to be made in the first place. So if a judge is looking for its spirit, I think the spirit of that constitution will be found somewhere in that struggle. If you're talking about a later constitution, um, an old constitution, I don't know where to find that spirit because probably um, the original struggle has changed. Uh, hopefully Professor uh, Craig will tell us about that. Where do you find the spirit of the English constitution? Although I suspect that the struggle continues all the time and judges must resonate with that struggle. Um, the last question I'll answer is this one. The colonial legacy and the constitutions that emerged there under. Um, what happened in Kenya, um, I don't know where this speaks of many of the constitutions in the Commonwealth, um, is that what the colonies had practiced was different from what they bequeathed, okay? Um, so they practiced tyranny, they practiced racism, um, 
they sort of created a bifurcated state, as uh, Mohammed Mahmoud Mamdani uh, has written, a state of a few privileged um, whites and uh, a majority black uh, that lives in poverty um, under customary law, has no access to rights, so, and the government is used many times to oppress them rather than to help them. But towards the end of the colonial epoch in Kenya, um, you see the colonies trying to establish constitutionalism, uh, trying to create a much more serious constitution, perhaps, than the one we have in some regards, like separation of powers. Um, in fact, in Kenya, they created a federal system, if you ask me, um, what we call the Majimbo system. Um, so the same people that had been socialized to see dictatorship, uh, that is the original fathers, the founding fathers and mothers, are now being asked to operate a constitutional government based on the rule of law. Uh, that is not going to work. And so the original constitutions that were left behind could not last even 10 years, even five. In fact, in our case, within a year, uh, President Kenyatta had amended that constitution and in three, four, five years, in, actually between 63 and 69, there was a new edition of the constitution being published with presidential powers increased, checked and balanced, weakened tremendously, and then a, 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 a tyranny, tyrannical regime established just within six, seven years. So yes, my answer to that is the colonies tried to establish proper constitutions. In reality, those constitutions could not last because the situations they had established, the conditions that created could not support those constitutions they tried to establish. I hope I've answered something, Craig. Thank you. Uh, Nick, I hope I've answered something. That's very helpful. Um, Great, thank you. Take it, Joe. You're um, on. So, so Nick, I'll, I'll take your advice seriously and not try to answer everything, but uh, just a, a cryptic answer to the first question about judicial politics. I think there's a difference between uh, constitutional politics, that is the proper domain of judges, and ordinary partisan politics, which isn't. Um, uh, more substantively, I'll take uh, the a couple of other questions uh, on the colonial legacy. I think there's a colonial legacy of British imperialism and an imperial legacy of post-colonial American um, uh, dominance in, in the global south. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I just think that the political science evidence on the presidential and the parliamentary model is so overwhelmingly clear that an American style presidential model is bad for democracy. It leads to unstable democratic regimes that I'm, I'm surprised this is still a debate that in, in, in pluralistic divided societies, uh, a parliamentary system alone can, can accommodate, uh, and, you know, and by parliamentary, I would include, I, I don't know enough about Kenya, but I would include countries like South Africa, which, uh, which are sort of somewhere in between. But anyway, that's, that's my thought about the legacies, uh, you know, there's, there's a US imposition as well. Um, on um, uh, on the spirit and on the fourth branch, I'll, I'll have a, you know an extra sentence for each of these answers. On the spirit of the Constitution, I would strongly recommend uh, Gary Jacobson's book, uh, Constitutional Identity. It's a difficult book to read. It's a, it's it's a difficult book to read, but an extremely insightful book. Um, and one of the takeaways from that, it, for me, was the distinction between internal and external disharmony in constitutions. Constitutions in divided societies that seek to reflect the division in their societies will be um, uh, will be closer to the society they are in, and therefore the external disharmony between the constitution and the society will be less. But those constitutions will necessarily speak in multiple voices and therefore display greater internal disharmony, will have multiple normative frameworks. On the other hand, constitutions that are internally tidy, normatively clean uh, in divided societies will necessarily have greater external disharmony. There will be a greater gap between the constitution and the society. So constitution framers have, in divided societies, have to walk this fine line of, you know, and the Indian constitution is largely, uh, you know, internally coherent, but with key internal discordance, disharmonies to accommodate uh, you know, people have called uh, the liberals, you know, the uh, anti-democrats, the socialists, the Hindu nationalists. And these provide creative spaces of tension and disharmony internal to the constitution, but also uh, a, a creative space for constitutional growth, not necessarily in areas that you would want it to grow, but you know, the current Modi regime is using precisely those few constitutional footholds provided for Hindu nationalism in an overwhelmingly secular constitution 
to, to, to push its agenda and create a different kind of society. So I think, I think that's a hard question to answer. And I think um, the choice, uh, the choice you can't completely exclude a section of society that you happen to have in favor of a clean, tidy, neat constitution because that will not be a stable constitution. So you have to include even the people you don't like <clears throat> or the ideology. And finally, the fourth branch. So um, a quick answer, is there a fourth branch? Not in every constitution. So these institutions, and I would even include intelligence agencies within, within that category, intelligence agencies, uh, electoral commissions, uh, central banks, whether they exist as a fourth branch or not is a matter of constitutional choice. They can either be within the executive branch as ministerial departments or reporting to ministries and departments and treated like executives. So in the US, for example, there is no independent electoral branch, electoral commission branch, or constitutions can treat them as a separate branch, which is a post-majoritarian branch, which does not fit with the vanity call model. So the, you know, the political opposition, we often treat them as losers, but they have all won votes and seats and come to parliament. And the fourth branch to my mind is a branch which uh, which gives a modicum of state power to the political opposition in, in, in shaping what the state should, should look like, uh, co-equal to the ruling party. Thank, thank you, Taryn. Kate? Uh, yes, thanks very much. So, so on the first question, I, I find that one of the difficulties of forming, formulating judges as political actors is it, it carries with it a whole lot of um, co connotations and baggage, which is often quite unhelpful. So it's better to sort of clear the ground by saying, as Taran did, that judges clearly, most emphatically, may not be politically partisan actors. Um, that would disqualify them, in my view, uh, from being eligible for judicial appointment. They need to be committed to the project of independence and impartiality in particular. But to recognize that what judges do inevitably has political consequences, um, and that's small p political consequences, but also sometimes partisan political consequences. And that the accountability of judges then in relation to their decision making lies in the quality of their reasoning and the processes that they follow. Um, and it is very much easier, I think, uh, being a judge under a written constitution with a very clear set of principles which guide the interpretation of the specific provisions of the constitution in terms of being able to provide coherent and um, uh, coherent reasons for decisions which have political implications. To me, one of the great difficulties of either a very old constitution like you find in the United States or an unwritten constitution as you find in the United Kingdom, it makes the judicial task harder because uh, it is much easier to work with a text which has been, uh, in our case, relatively recently agreed on and which is very upfront about um, principles, as is the Kenyan constitution. It's been surprising, I think, in, in South Africa how extensively courts and lawyers and indeed um, um, people engaged in kind of political debate have relied upon our founding principles of the constitution, founding values of the constitution, which talks about um, the exercise of public power being accountable, open and responsive, and how useful that's been in thinking about some of the specific uh, constitutional challenges have arisen. In other words, is this answer going to lead to more accountability, more openness, more responsiveness, or is it in fact going to lead to kind of clandestine um, and uh, unresponsive? So these are the kind of ways in which judges reason. So I tend to think that, as I say, I don't think we're, the ju I think judges may not be partisan, but they, they will have, uh, their decisions will have implications. In relation to your second point about the dis decreasing disrespect, I, I, I think that seems so. I think it may seem so to most generations and perhaps most generations of judges might feel this um, a lot. Um, but I, I feel very strongly that a, an independent and competent judiciary relies very strongly um, on a strong legal profession, um, both protecting and engaging and criticizing the judiciary where appropriate, but also a strong academy. I think universities and scholars uh, are crucial to the independence of the judiciary and to the project of judicial independence. It is, in my view, not helpful uh, for judges to get in a sort of tit-for-tat conversation with the executive over a disagreement over their judgments. It, 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 it's, it, it damages very often the project of impartiality and it is not a suitable role for judges. But that is the role where, of course, in the first place, the executive should defend the judiciary from attacks. But we know 
all too often that doesn't happen. But that's the role then, I think, for the organized profession um, and also for um, the academy. I also think that um, the academy has a particular importance in improving the quality of um, judicial outputs, um, the, you know, the, the engagement, critical engagement with worker courts on a doctrinal level seems to me absolutely crucial um, to the task of building a coherent and responsive uh, legal um, order. And um, we, we, we should never underestimate the importance of um, university and scholars in that regard. Um, um, I, I think I've probably said enough and other people have spoken about the spirit of the constitution. Um, just to say finally that I do think the fourth branch is an important in innovation in um, modern um, in modern constitutions, and although no uh, institutional innovations are you know, perfect in themselves, there are all sorts of factors which will determine how they'll function. I think they're, um, they're, they do play an important role in South Africa. And I think that, um, I mean, it, it, the, the graph on the Electoral Commission that, that Turin showed, I thought, was, was pretty alarming. And we recognize how important electoral commissions are. I'm quite interested in the role of social media in elections. And it seems to me that one of the first actors there to, to try and address this problem should be electoral commissions globally. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, Paul? So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Nick, for very helpfully framing the questions that you've received. Um, again, coming kind of forth in this, I'm tempted to say, you know, um, what judges on a four-person bench might say, I have nothing usefully to add to the excellent speeches of my learned colleagues. But um, just, to, just to add a few words, because I, I really do agree pretty much with uh, most everything that's been said. Just on the um, judicial politics part, I really do agree uh, with the way in which um, everyone said it, Taryn and, and, and Kate, who spoke about this in detail. Look, I don't think uh, courts should get involved in any kind of public tit for tat. It's really, that would be diminishing their status uh, and would be a really bad thing to do, and they don't. Uh, and that's absolutely right that they do. In terms of you know, uh, judicial politics more generally, um, again, I agree with what's been said. It's obviously the case that judges should not be politically partisan, and thankfully, in, uh, certainly in the UK, they are not. Um, equally, it's a fortiori the case that if you've got a doctrine of constitutional law or doctrine of administrative law, then any decision that you make will have political consequences of some kind or another. But what's also important to understand in that respect is that not to intervene may have political consequences as just as much as a decision to intervene. So, for example, I mean, that's just exemplified in spades, as it were, by the two big Miller cases. Whatever you think of the outcome, I think the outcome was right. In both cases, other, some other people do not. But what you cannot claim, if you disagree with those decisions, you cannot claim that deciding the other way would have been a decision which had no political consequence, because that's simply unarguable. It's an untenable proposition. To have said that, the Prime Minister could take us out of the U European Union without getting the consent of Parliament, or to say that the executive could prorogue Parliament in the way that it did in Miller too, if the court had come down uh, in those ways and in, in those cases, they too would have had obviously political consequences. No important decision about structural constitutional review or rights-based constitutional review can ever be given without it having some political consequence. That's my first point. Second point is that I think that the courts in the UK actually are very well aware. It doesn't mean that there are certain decisions which may not be criticized, but I think they're very well aware of the limits of what they should be doing, both at common law and under the HRA. It is not, uh, and this is not fanciful, we have 
literally, I mean, I, you know, I'm just updating my administrative law book at the moment. I could give you kind of 30 cases from the last three years of the Supreme Court, forget the Court of Appeal, forget the House of the High Court, in which they make very clear their belief in respect, deference, discretionary area of judgment, whatever you want to call it, under the HRA, when, uh, when adjudicating pursuant to that legislation. Final, final point, because I know we're out of time. Just that the only point I'd add to the fourth branch of government is this. I think there is a fourth branch of government. The only point I would add to what's been said already is that certainly in relation to the UK, if by the fourth branch of government you mean or you include inter alia um, independent agencies, okay, and that's usually included as part of the fourth branch of government, then that isn't a recent phenomenon. We had those agencies from the 15th century onwards, and indeed most of the functions of government were performed, or my, many of the functions of government were performed by those agencies for 400 years. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Mukami, I don't know, your, your camera's off. I don't know if you want to ha say a few words before I, I gracefully thank the panelists. Uh, thank you, Nick. I have nothing, nothing more to add. I think um, the panelists have done a, a great job and hopefully we can continue the conversations. I hope so too. So I hope this is the first of many uh, uh, seminars that we run between our various um, institutions. Um, well, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, I thought that was a great discussion. Um, I thought it worked extremely well and I've learned a lot about the um, jurisdictions that we've heard from. Um, so thank you very much. And we finished almost exactly on 12, at uh, 12 o'clock. So that will uh, uh, please uh, Kate and the Bonavero who can get their uh, 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 podcast online. Um, thank you very much um, and goodbye Bye. everyone. Thank you everyone. Have a Bye. good rest of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Bye.